Welcome to What the Heck is Stationarity? This is the first of a set of video tutorials on the subject of computing directional sample variograms. Now, you're probably wondering, what the heck does stationarity have to do with computing sample variograms? Well, the answer is that many data sets are initially not suitable for variogram calculations. And in that case, the calculated sample variograms may be totally useless. And so, if you know a bit about models and their stationarity properties, you'll be in a better position to work with problem data sets and extract meaningful sample variograms. The problem in general, then, is to infer population statistics from a sample. In variography, we are typically given a sample of spatial data, generally from some earthy population, and we wish to infer the patterns of spatial continuity of the earthy populations. In order for us to be able to infer the population statistics from our sample, we're going to have to rely on the use of models of one kind or another. And as you will see in the following slides, models are absolutely necessary. So let me show you a few examples that illustrate the necessity of modeling. Suppose you're given the following sample data from some unknown population, and you wish to complete the profile between the green sample data points. Now suppose you're told that these data points were taken from the peak heights of a trajectory of a bouncing soccer ball. And given this model, you could complete the profile of bouncing soccer ball as follows. Well, alternatively, let's say you're told that the green sample data points are distance and velocity measurements of a decelerating or slowing automobile, and these measurements were taken at regular time intervals. Given this model, you could complete the profile this way. Velocity is plotted on the y-axis, while distance traveled is plotted on the x-axis. Note that the velocity and distance traveled between data points decreases as the automobile is slowing down because the data was taken at regular time intervals. Here is another example showing the necessity of models. Suppose we are given the east-west and north-south variogram ranges from some particular data set, and we plot those ranges as shown here. Note the east-west range, or the east range, I should say, is much longer than the north range. And this is a common pattern known as anisotropic spatial continuity. And from this phrase, we get the term anisotropic or anisotropy. Now, suppose from these two directions we wish to map the variogram ranges in all possible directions. We can begin to complete the map of ranges in all directions by remembering that the south range is simply the reverse of the north range. And similarly, the west range is simply the reverse of the east range. However, in order to map the ranges in other directions, we're going to have to resort to using a model of some kind or another. For example, this is a rectangular model of the variogram ranges in all directions. It is a simple model and easy to work with. For example, we can map the northeast variogram range or the south-southwest variogram range or the west-west-north variogram range with this model. In fact, we can map the variogram range for any direction using this model. However, the model appears to provide some unexpected results. For example, the west-west-north range, that's this one here, appears to be or actually is longer than the west range. So that is uh, kind of unexpected. So let's try another model. Here is the diamond model. And again, we see that the diamond model provides us with variogram range in any direction. The model is a bit better than the rectangular model in that at least there are no model ranges longer than the east or west data ranges. 
However, we note that the model ranges in directions just a few degrees off of the west direction here is significantly shorter than the east-west data range here. So that may be something that we can't uh, actually see when we compute real sample variogram data in ranges that are just off of west, for example. Our third model is an ellipse in two dimensions and an ellipsoid in three dimensions. You should note that all three models, that is the earlier uh, rectangular model, the triangle model, and the ellipse model, can easily provide models of variogram ranges in three dimensions. Of course, most of you will recognize the ellipse, and ellipse is the model that is used in geostatistics. You might ask, why is the ellipse the chosen model? Well, the answer is because the ellipse or ellipsoid is known to fit ranges calculated in various directions from many different data sets over time. In other words, the ellipse appears to be a model that satisfactorily fits calculated ranges from real-world data over time. Hopefully, by now, you should be convinced that models are necessary if we wish to infer population statistics. Next, we will look at two different classes of models. And these two classes are deterministic and probabilistic models. I'd like to begin by looking at deterministic models. And when talking about models, I like to draw a line down the center of the page. And then I'll label the left side of the page deterministic models. And on the right side, the real world. I find that this helps clarify whether the statistic or property under discussion, or that we're talking about when in a group, for example, pertains to the real world or to a model of the real world. Sometimes in these groups, it's just not clear exactly which one folks are referring to. Well, let's continue by giving ourselves a, a, a real-world example, and in this case, a chicken egg. So this is a chicken egg from the real world. My first deterministic model of the chicken egg is a simple circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. The fit is not so good, and so you might ask, can we do better? Well, how about an ellipse? The ellipse is a better fit. But we can still do better by modifying the equation of an ellipse to give us something that looks pretty much like an egg. These are all examples of deterministic models. Unfortunately, however, deterministic models generally don't play much of a role in geostatistics. In fact, it's the probabilistic models, and random variables in particular, that are the cornerstone of geostatistics. And so the next few slides are all about random variables, just in case they are something you're not too familiar with. So you can ask, what is a random variable? Remember your basic algebra, where you had variables such as x and y, and where each represented a single numerical value. Well, random variables are similar except that each random variable represents a distribution of possible values. It's called random because its specific outcome or value can be any value from its distribution of possible values, according to some probability law. Let me illustrate this with this slide here. This slide illustrates random variable models of sample data. For example, suppose we have a blue sample data point at a specific location, and here blue represents the actual sample value at that location. We can model the blue sample value as an outcome of a random variable. Although in general, a random variable consists of a number of possible values, at this specific location, we say the outcome of the random variable is a single value which is blue, and that corresponds to the sample value. A second sample is located more or less in the center of the sample domain, yielded a red sample value. And so similarly, our model of this sample is a red outcome. And we have a third example here, and it turned out to be green. 
Again, our model of the green sample is a green outcome of a random variable. Now, the random variable model can also be applied to any or all unsampled locations. For example, the uncolored circle indicates a location which has not been sampled yet. The random variable model at this location is simply the histogram of possible without an outcome. In other words, the actual but unknown sample value could be any one of the random variable values in that particular model. Here is a second example of an unsampled location and its random variable model. Let's go back to the model versus real world format. And on the right, we have the real world as represented by a stack of maps showing various colored spatial sample data set from maps of the USA. In geostatistics, we're generally concerned with inferring population averages, variability, and spatial continuity from sample data. And to do this, we make use of probabilistic models, namely the random variables. Random variables are a function of their location. It's a function of the location, x, y, z. Sometimes we get a bit lazy, <clears throat> and rather than writing out the full random variable as a function of x, y, and z, we simply write it out as a function of x, understanding that x represents all three coordinates, and then we even get lazier and just write v, and understanding that it's a function of x, y, and z. Since the random variable consists of a distribution or histogram of all possible values, we can calculate the mean, the variance, and the semivariogram value given by these equations, where lowercase v are outcomes of the random variable. There are three properties that random variables must have to enable statistical inference of population statistics. One, the mean must be stationary. Two, the variance must be stationary. And three, the variance of the differences between random variable pairs must also be stationary for all h. What do we mean by the word or the term stationary? Well, here it is, the official definition of stationarity. The local average of the random variable does not depend on location. That is, there is no spatial trend in the random variable outcomes. Two, the local variance of the random variable also does not depend on location. That is, there is no trend in the local variance of random variable outcomes. And three, for all vectors h, the variance of the differences, that is, v of x minus v of x plus h, does not depend on location. That is, there is no trend in the local variance of differences. I put this slide up here to illustrate the stationary concepts. Note that the distribution or histogram of all of these random variables has the same shape, and thus they have the same mean and the same variance. And although it is not apparent, the variances of differences between pairs is also constant. And thus these variables shown here are said to be stationary. And if some of the variables here had different means or variances, they actually would be useless for inferring any population statistic, and that would include spatial continuity or the variogram. Well, next I'm going to show you an example of a stationary process. And if you ask, what is a stationary process? Well, a stationary process is simply a series of random variable outcomes. For example, each white dot in this zoom window here is the outcome of a random variable. And I have simply joined the outcomes with a green line to sort of complete the graph. This is the same stationary process shown in the previous slide and with the addition of its statistics. 
We are interested in the mean, which is 1.67 here. The variance, which is 0 0.66, 0 0.66 here. And the sample variogram shown here on the right. We note that there are 1,000 outcomes or sample data points in this profile. So this is a standardized sample variogram, and I will discuss standardized sample variograms in the next video. Okay, because this is a stationary process, we can look at subsets of the process and compare their statistics to one another and also to the global process. So for example, here we have divided the process into two subsets shown by the blue and yellow colors. And then we compute the statistics of each subset. So we have the mean 1.63, there are only 500 observations, the variance is 0.62, and the sample variogram is shown here. Next we do the same thing for the yellow subset. We note that its mean is 1.72, there are 500 samples, and the variance is 0 0.70, and this is the sample variogram. Next, let's compare the statistics of the subsets to the global statistics all in one slide. So here we are. The green is the global statistics. Note there are 1,000 observations, mean of 1.67, variance 0.66, and we compare that to 1.63, 0.61, 1.72, 0 0.70, and here are all three variograms plotted on the same figure. You can see from this that process statistics for subsets and globally compare quite well, uh, and that includes mean, variance, and sample variogram. Well, what about a non-stationary example? We can interpret this slide as follows. We're looking at a graph of sample values, which can also be seen as a series of outcomes from two different but stationary random variables, as indicated or shown by the blue and yellow graphs. For example, the mean of the blue graph is obviously less than the mean of the yellow graph. Similarly, the variance of the blue graph is also less than the variance of the yellow graph. Obviously, the global mean and variance computed from the combined colors would not be representative of the global statistics. The global sample variogram doesn't appear to reach a plateau and certainly is not a good model of the spatial continuity of either the blue or yellow profiles as shown by the blue and yellow sample variograms on the right. Here is a second example showing a data profile with a trend in the mean, as well as a trend in the variance. Note that as the local mean increases, so does the local variance. This is a very common pattern seen with earth science data, particularly in mining, where base metal assay samples almost always show similar trends. In fact, an increasing variance with increasing mean is known as the proportional effect. Note the parabolic behavior at, in, at an accelerating rate as the lag distance increases, and note that it never appears to reach a plateau or sill. This sample variogram pattern is well known amongst geostatisticians and is convincing evidence of a trend in your data. Such a sample variogram is useless for all subsequent geostatistical calculation. So let's conclude this video then with a couple of points. In order to calculate meaningful sample variograms from your sample data, the local means and local variances must not contain a global trend. And two, any mixture of statistical populations with unique population means or variances must be dealt with separately. I will show how to deal with trends in a subsequent video called Working with Difficult Data. That's it for this video. Thank you.